My name is Dave Hollenbach, the host of From Embers to Excellence. My goal is to explore the many facets of leadership from the perspectives of some amazing people. In addition to leadership, I like to discuss mental health, PTSD, and overcoming adversity. If you have a favorite episode, I would love to hear about it. Message me through social media or my website, and I will share some free tools to help you achieve your goals. Please like, subscribe, and leave a review. If you haven't purchased your copy of my book, Fireproof, please grab a copy today. Thanks for listening. Today, I'm speaking with Nicholas Yanni. He is the founder and director of Core Presence. He is an expert in transformational leadership, presence, peak performance, and innovation. He's all th- also, <clears throat> he is also the author of Leader as Healer. Uh, he has an extensive history, a- incredible credentials. I am, you know, reading about him, was blown away. You know, I, I strive to bring the best guests on here. And uh, I-, I know that uh, Nicholas will not disappoint. So, Nicholas, thank you so much for agreeing to come on. I know it's late there in Italy, but I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with me today. Thank you, Dave. I'm really honored to be here. So I'm looking forward to our dialogue. Yes, sir. Uh, w- well, let's start off with where you were born and raised, what life was like for you early on, and maybe some of your early influences that that set you on this path. Sure. So I was born in London, uh, the only child in a show business family. My father was an Italian Jew who had to flee from Milan in very traumatic circumstances just before the Second World War. Ended up in in England, married my English non-Jewish mother. And I was brought up in a, in London, in really in the heart of show business London. Um, and my life changed dramatically age 16. So I was at school, you know, I was a 16-year-old, full of London, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, fully signed up. And a friend of mine said, listen, I'm going up to a Tibetan Buddhist monastery to visit my grandmother. She's a Tibetan Buddhist nun. Do you want to come? And honestly, we went up in the spirit of it's a laugh. You know, it's going to be different. Let's see. So up we go to Scotland, small place, now one of the biggest in Europe. And um, it was all very exotic and challenging, you know, to sit for hours in meditation and like, But anyway, at a certain moment, Dave, someone gave me a classical Buddhist text to read. And I was sitting in our room reading it. And literally, it was like a huge curtain open. And I knew what this was talking about. And the core message it was saying was, we live in a much smaller version of reality than the one that's actually available and truer. I'd never heard anything like that, but I knew this. And honestly, that set the course of the rest of my life. (laughs) No, that's, that's incredible. And I, I I really love uh, hearing about, well, these, these stories of transformation and, and the, the story. And what, what was the text that you were reading? I honestly can't remember, other than it, than it was a classical Buddhist text. I have no idea what it was. Um, but, you know, I was just, I knew that was the way, or at least I knew the truth of that. So, you know, I became what's called a seeker. And then there was Alan Watts, there was Carlos Castaneda, there were, you know, stuff that was like obsessing me. Um, you know, and then I went into the theater because, first of all, my father was a very famous filmmaker, so I couldn't follow him into film, but I was in the arts. I knew I was in the arts, so I went into theater, and I um, I had a great mentor, a very famous Polish theater director, who also showed me a way in which theater was a 
actually an exploration of some of our highest possibilities, like the state of the actor, a bit like, you know, sports people talk about being in the zone. So in the theater equivalent, it was when actors would go into a kind of extraordinarily open state. You would feel their frequency, like they were on fire in a way. Their body was completely open. Their emotions were open. They were like channels. And I spent 20 years exploring that with, with my own company. I taught at actually Europe's most famous theatre school in London. Um, and I was completely, it was fascinating work. But my interest actually was how would this be more intentional? You know, instead of the occasional amazing experience, how could we really practice this? So, you know, I was studying many different forms of psychology, body work, spiritual disciplines. And then my life took a big turn in around 1997 when we were, I was part of the company that opened the, the Globe Theatre in London, Shakespeare's Globe Theatre, which is an amazing theatre. And um, we, during the rehearsals, we were invited to explore Shakespeare's Henry V, which was the opening production, uh, with a group of um, senior leaders in public service. And after three days exploring the story of Henry V, they said, we've learned more about leadership in these three days than we can ever remember. And this kind of lit, uh, you know, kind of switched a light on, as in, wow, okay, so let's develop this. And we started working, <clears throat> it took us about three years to really refine this process of using a few of Shakespeare's stories that seem to have something to say about leadership into programs. And we were supported by a, one of England's um, management schools. And by 2001, we were quite inundated with work and we got really good at it. So we actually quit the theatre and went full time into this. And um, we were, three of us co-founded the company. We created a methodology which we called Mythodrama, which is now in the, in the lexicon. Um, and, you know, within a few years, we expanded. We were working all around the world. We, we would take senior teams on five-day retreats. And each day would explore one act of Shakespeare's play. They all have five acts. And it was nothing to do with acting the play. It was like, this is happening in the story. Let's look at how this is happening in you. And it was, a, you know, it was a really good methodology and we were really good at it. And, and um, that was, you know, that went on for a while until it was time for me to leave and do my own thing and stop using Shakespeare. And then I focused entirely on what I call presence. What is the authentic presence of the leader, which includes all parts of him or her, not just the um, rational part. And then a few years back, this literally like a kind of phrase, leader is healer, dropped into my consciousness one day. And it was one of those things where you kind of think, I think I need to listen to this. Strange as it sounded, because it's not exactly a normal phrase. Uh, anyway, I, I, I tentatively mentioned it to a couple of CEO clients. They were like, yes. Yes. And actually lockdown was a good time to write a book. So <laughs> I started writing more and more. It took me two and a half years in the end. And it's landed in a way I could never have imagined, actually. The, the reception has been incredible. Yeah. What more could we need now than healing, Dave? I mean, yes. we are in such big crisis. Yeah. Who was the... Uh, audience that you were writing to senior leaders senior leaders oh yeah, yeah 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 that's my that's my that's the group of people i work with i teach at two of the world's leading business schools i work with ceos one-to-one -one. i work with big organizations 
I'm currently, I think it sounds surprising, but I'm currently running a big leader as healer project with one of the world's leading law firms. I mean, that I don't think would have happened a few years ago. And by the way, they are experiencing a lot of transformation through it. Yeah. Can can we explore this this concept of leader yeah. and healer? I, yeah, I'm, I'm really curious. So listen, the, the the central premise is very simple. We have normalized a way of operating, which you see goes back to my epiphany, age sixteen. We have normalized a way of operating, which I call a, a narrow bandwidth. And it's dominated by our rational thinking. Most people show up with an inner identity of, I am here as thinker. That's who I am, thinker. And everything is about thinking our way through everything. But we, so we have exiled so many other parts of us and actually so many rich parts. We've totally forgotten what it means to be embodied the richness of life when we're embodied. We've forgotten that the thinking mind does not feel anything. It does not experience the world. We cannot experience anything with our thinking. So, so long as I am here as thinker, I'm in a very small part of reality. We've exiled our emotions. <clears throat> we call things positive and negative, weak, No, we've, that's a whole huge part of who we are. We've exiled our intuition. We've exiled our ability to sit in a kind of deeply receptive listening to new ideas. So leader as healer is saying, guys, we need to bring all that back. We need to listen to Einstein, by the way, who said, you all need to ask yourselves, is your mind your master or your servant? And in 99% of the leaders I meet, it's their master because we've normalized that. We're taught that early on in school, thinking is the most important. So my work is a radical, uncompromising subversion of that. How do you, how do you accomplish that? Like what is, I mean, I, I know you can't really give away all your secrets or even uh, distill it down uh, so much that um, I, I just... Well, I, I can do my best. I can do my best. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, I mean, first of all, I present this fact that, that I see. My opening line is usually something like, listen, you're functioning with at less than 50% of your full possibility. And you have normalized that, so you don't even realize that. Then I point out what I mean by that. Then we talk about things like being and doing, and how doing is like the whole modality we're in all the time, this kind of hyperactive fixing, fixing. And people understand. I have I have a way of explaining it. Almost no one says, what are you talking about? The people know this. So once we've agreed on the territory, then we start working experientially. So like I'll do a whole somatic piece. I get people lying on the floor. We do a whole reconnection with the body. And I explain what do we lose by having exiled our body? What do we lose by not being embodied. It's huge. And people agree then. We do a whole contact, breathing, grounding. And at the end of that, people are like, wow, wow. I feel very different right now. So we've already opened a big door. However, the I would say the big turning point always is the emotional because we're so frightened of our emotions and we invent all these stories about negative emotion. No, we have to manage our emotions. And around about day two in the, in the program I lead, boom, the emotions open, men start crying. Then we're in a different territory altogether. 
then there's a melting. And by the way, that's a big deal in corporate world. When men start crying, that's a big deal. And that's a huge opening in the whole group as well. And then we're in a different territory because we are like that, Dave. We're like that. That's how we function. And we've normalized it. And, you know, it's a little bit like you go and you have a great massage and that happens. And it's only then that you realize, ah, oh, I'm walking around like that and I didn't even notice. So it's like a wake up. We honestly, I, we exist in a kind of coma. We're so disconnected. We don't listen to each other. We don't feel each other. You look at the way people are talking, it's talking at. There's not a connection. Teams don't have forgotten what it means to really connect. When I work with groups, it's transformational. By the end of two days, people are like open, connected. And then I give a lot of practices. How do you maintain this? Because this has got to be a practice. It's no good having a beautiful experience. This has to be practiced. And of course, along the way, particularly in, because I also do one-to-one -one coaching with some very senior people, we touch big trauma territory. We have to, we have to, we have to go right back into their childhood. We have to see what they're carrying from their lineage, because whatever your parents didn't process will come to you. We know that now. We work with collective layers of trauma. Sometimes I coach two African-American CEOs, and we have had to dive deep into the imprint they're carrying in their DNA, because it's there in their bodies. And it shows up. All of this shows up. If, you, if someone is more bothered than seems right by something, okay, what's the origin of this? The origin of this is the world is not a safe place for me. That's a collective imprint. And it's no good thinking about it or discussing it. We have to feel it. And then the body alchemizes. So it's very direct work that I do. It's I'm all about breaking the narrative. You ask someone how they're doing, you'll get 10 minutes of narrative, which has very little to do with how they're actually doing. <laughs> in, in, in your book, do you... Do you teach the reader uh, these practices? Yeah, each each chapter finishes with practices. Yeah, yeah, very much so. It's intended, to, and some of them, Dave, are very, they're very simple, but they're very powerful. They're very powerful practices. Of pra they can be really simple, even to the point where you think that's too simple. But then you start working with it, and you see what an effect it has. Can, can you give me an example of one? Yeah, okay. So, just as you're sitting here, Dave, just start to notice your breathing for a moment. Not think about it, just notice the sensations of your breathing. Meaning you, you, you notice each in-breath, each out-breath, exactly like you're curious to discover the sensations so you're looking at me but a whole part of your attention is going into your body and then you start to relax the out breath a bit and do that deliberately so the out breath becomes a subtle melting inside because we hold the out breath yeah, just let the out-breath go longer. And then you may start to feel, okay, now I feel my face more, my, my pelvis, I feel my contact with the chair. Each out-breath. Now maybe you feel your legs more. And you start to notice even your feet in contact with the ground.
And maybe you start to feel, okay, I, I feel more here in a certain way, like I, my, my, my sense of my own presence already changed a bit. I'm here. So I call this the backward circle, meaning I bring my attention back and down. And then I can receive the world. Then if I'm talking to someone, there's a much higher possibility that I actually notice who I'm really talking to. I feel a bit what's happening in them. Because we think listening is like that. No, that's not listening. I'm not here when I'm like that. I need to be here. And that means I'm embodied. So I teach people how to pay attention to this throughout the day. Before every meeting, there should be at least two minutes practice of this. And you will have a different meeting. If you did this every time your phone rang before you answered it, in, instead of, you know, like, hi, I'm exaggerating, but phone rings, hello, you would feel a difference and people would feel a difference. You feel? How do you feel now? Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty interesting. I, mm -hmm. I've I've talked about this in the past, but it, it's interesting. You, you know, you you have the knowledge, but to implement it sometimes isn't um, yeah. really. We're so habituated, or habitu uh, the behavior is so instilled yes to operate in a certain way and changing it by taking that time uh to to come into the present um, yes is yeah. uh yeah that's definitely not our culture is it it's, it's completely not <laughs> our culture. no this is absolutely counter-cultural as is all the emotional work because our culture largely thinks it's much better not to be emotional, just to be rational, as if that was even possible. <clears throat> because actually everyone is driven by the emotions they're trying not to feel. It's, I, I mean, it's incredible that we're having this conversation because I've really been digging into this myself. Right. Uh, I, I've struggled with PTSD for quite some time. Wow. And, um, and, you know, you read The Body Keeps the Score and, uh, you know, books on flow, uh, right. neuroscience behind trauma. And uh, it's the, the four pieces that I've been trying to implement into my life when I actually do it it mm. makes things a lot better but it's the uh the practice of gratitude uh okay. the the mindfulness component where you focus on your breath and your presence and uh and then you know the exercise component and and sleep getting the appro appropriate amount of rest so you're taking care of your body yes uh and and really connecting your mind to your body through what you're talking about but right. it I, I feel like there is such a benefit to having a coach that really I was just you. about to say <laughs> I was about to say yeah I, I was literally about to say that you first of all you're obviously doing great through doing all of that. And we all need at times a guide, a coach, a mentor, because there's one other component that sooner or later you need to um, turn towards, which is the whole emotional. It's like there's a whole part of you you're carrying inside that is waiting for you to be ready to look at it feelingly. Feelingly, and that has to be in your own time when you're ready, and then you definitely need a guide for that. 
there, there's been a couple of things that you've said that has really resonated with me. One of them is, you know, the, the DNA aspect of, yeah. you know, our ancestral DNA, the trauma that has been passed on. And I mean, yeah. it, it, they talk about it in, or the, the guy that wrote the body keeps the score right. talks about it in there, which is, uh, you know, when you're talking about post-traumatic stress, that is like one of the main texts that people study. Uh, yes. And yes. and then the uh, the part of the the trauma, the emotion piece of it, how we feel, and and naming it good or bad. Yeah. There has been this, uh, and, and this has been huge for me, and this is just in the last couple of weeks where I actually, um, I mean, you say it better, uh, but this is how I kind of processed it in my brain, is that there, there really isn't any good or bad, there just is. Exactly. And, and, exactly, and, and that's a really big change in our whole approach you know for instance Dave people most people believe fear blocks me right now, if I could get rid of my fear that would be much better but actually you know if I'm working with someone and and they contact anxiety and who doesn't feel anxiety at the moment and we and it feels safe enough for them with my kind of gentle holding. And I say, you know, if you're willing, just feel it for a moment. Stop fighting it. And don't explain it to me because that's your way of not feeling it. Just feel it in your body for a moment. Re relax towards it. And they're willing. And so they do that. And I'm there. Within three or four or five minutes, they feel so open and grounded in their body. And then we understand, no, I thought fear blocked me. No, actually, the problem is I block fear. I'm frightened to feel fear. Or I don't feel safe enough to feel fear. That's the issue. Fear is a human emotion. There's nothing negative about it. And sadness and tears melt our heart. A man who can't cry is dangerous. I started working with a new CEO recently, and I said, when was the last time you cried? And he, he thought, he said, I think it was about six years ago. That's serious. What does that mean? That means the heart is like frozen. We cannot be a good leader with a frozen heart. This is really, man, L leader is healer. As healer, yeah. Uh, leader as healer. So, uh, uh, so individuals that are in leadership positions, learning to become a healer, bring this into their world and help other people live in the present yes I, i'm th is that the the con is, am i wrapping my head around it yeah you are and, and and we have to understand that there's a damn good business reason for that as well this is not just about well-being this is about creating high performing teams who also have the capacity to navigate this turbulent time, which is more and more complex, more and more volatile, more and more unpredictable. So long as we think I can navigate that with the rational mind alone, we're living in cloud cuckoo land. That requires much more of us. For instance, a senior leader now, and this is, I'm not the only one saying this by a long way, has to be comfortable with not knowing. 
has to be able to hold his or her team in not knowing. Otherwise, we just rush to find a solution it's because we can't tolerate the discomfort of not knowing. So this is about high performance. It's not about well-being primarily. That's a, that's a kind of add-on. It's much deeper than that. This is about becoming people who can navigate what's going on right now. And for that, we need a new consciousness. The old consciousness has got us to this cliff edge. How come, how come we have all the technology we need to solve hunger and climate change and we do nothing with it? How come? How come? Our, our leaders, I, I, I would say, are more interested in self-enrichment than the exactly. world. Exactly. It's and are driven by power. They're not human beings because leader as healer, it's not so much as a healer, it's a subtle difference. Leader as healer embodies a presence of coherence in which body, mind, heart, and soul are much more aligned. So she or he transmits that into the culture. Teams cohere in a different way. Teams are allowed to say, I feel frightened right now. And we don't explain it, we just embrace it. You know, I worked with a Brazilian team recently and the, and, and the leader said, you know, in our culture, basically everyone is only allowed to feel happy, motivated and inspired. I mean, that's ridiculous. What kind of a human being always feels happy, motivated and inspired? It's like, what are you talking about? And then you expect that there'll be high performance. It's so messed up as a way of thinking. No, if you're feeling, you know, it's like a leader as healer would pause a meeting if, if she or he feels there's a lot of anxiety and would simply say, listen, let's face it, this is tough and I, I know you're, a lot of you are feeling anxious. I am too. I'm not sleeping well at the moment. Let's just acknowledge that. It's okay. What happens is a, and then we start thinking much more clearly and coherently. Otherwise, we're all sitting there like that. No, I'm not allowed to say I'm afraid. I'm not allowed to feel anxious. I'm supposed to be happy and motivated. And you want me to think clearly? No, that's not how the human being works. I just did this talk today uh, about leading in high stress environments and the neuroscience behind these exercises that I've utilized when in uh, command of you know pretty uh, intense situations. And yes, um, it was it was interesting. We actually, uh, I was talking about box breathing and me and the entire group did box breathing. Um, and there was, uh, I don't know, just like a, a relaxed feeling. It wasn't quite like this because I can tell you right now, you guiding me uh, through the breathing and uh, connection um with with the ground and the and you know the here and now uh is a little more deep than that but how powerful is that and it's extremely effective right it's trans it's genuinely transformational okay I started working <laughs> with this law firm a while back. And at the beginning of the first in-person retreat, I said, we're going to do some transformational work. And one of the partners, immediately, a woman said, Nicholas, don't use that word. We hear it all the time. OK, I said, all right, I won't use the word. At the end of the day at dinner, she raised a glass and she said, Nicholas, we did transformational work today. <laughs> <It was really laughs> nice. 
This is transformational. What do you attribute that to? What 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 do I attribute what to? The 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 transformation that comes ah. with this practice. Well, fundamentally, I'm embodying this. So I'm not just speaking this. There's a there's a transmission even here now. Leader is healer because of the it's a coherence of the nervous system. So that anyone in a leadership position is anyway transmitting all the time, and everyone is affected. So once the leader of a group is showing up with a really deep, coherent presence, underneath everything, that's a, it's a transmission and an invitation, which is received nervous system to nervous system. Then there's the coherence of the theory, and then there's experiential exercises. Like the moment you start engaging the body, everything changes. The moment emotions start opening, everything changes. So it's a combination of all of that. Theory alone will never, ever, ever be enough. You, you touched on it, um, your experience that really kind of led to this um, realization, uh, you know, when, when leader as healer came to you. Yeah. Um, what were some of the events leading up to that realization that maybe set the stage for you? Right. Uh, I don't know, having having that. Right. Well, okay, now that's a lovely question because I think there's something very important we need to understand here, which is that for my to my mind real developmental work has two parts like two streams so one is the meditative mindful subtle body qigong yoga martial arts that's one whole stream the other stream is where we attend to all the emotional layers that we have exiled you can call it shadow work, whatever you want to call it. But it's very distinct. That is the part that in pretty much the whole leadership world is not done. I know very few corporate coaches who touch that. And this without that is not enough. Because this sits inside us. You can do all the mindful grounding you want and you will hit a buffer. And then you'll feel, no, it's not working. I don't know why. And you push off. It's not working because you're hitting a layer of emotion that you're not attending to. So what I can tell you is that for, for at least the last five, six, seven years, I have worked myself in those two streams and continue to do so. So that means I have worked with my own traumas, my father's trauma, which he totally packed away. And it's been dark. This is not easy work. That's also why it's, you know, it's not often happening. It's not the American, excuse me, said, it's not the American version of let's all feel happy. No, it's serious work. It's serious confronting of what we're carrying while having a very committed meditation practice. So I've done that. If, if I can do what I'm doing now, it's only because I'm continually doing my own work and hitting more and more layers, it's forever. Our own inner healing work will be forever, and that's fine. That's that's how it is, and it's rich. And I'm actually feeling that I'm going through more expansion than at any other time in my life. And I'm in my 60s because I keep doing the work, and I keep having my whole life is about the groups, the partnerships, where we can do that work together. We can't do it alone, Dave. We cannot do it alone. 
We need small circles, large circles that do both those streams, not this one without this one. It's very common in the spiritual meditation world just to do this. Even you hear people say, no, well, that deals with all the emotions. It doesn't. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't. That's a lovely fantasy. It doesn't. Meditation does not heal trauma. We can regulate ourselves, but it doesn't heal. Right. Yeah, that, I mean, spot on. That. I mean, that was exactly what I was going to say is that unless you do the work to dig in and heal the those traumas, you're just going to continue to carry them along. And exactly. the, the meditation piece is exactly what you, you could be more mindful. You could be more present. Yeah. But if you're not also healing the traumas from the past, there's no growth. No, there's also, I would suggest like sometimes I, you know, if, you, if people want to see why this is important, look at your life. Look at what's really working or not working. Look, for instance, at your or my capacity for intimacy. Really look. And then you'll see whether you're open or not. Then you'll see the, the limitations you carry into every relationship. This uh, book that we're talking about is, is not the only book that you've written, right? It, it, yeah, I co-wrote a book a long time ago uh, with the co-founder of Mythodrama in 2004. This is my first solo book. Okay. Man, uh, you didn't mess around, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and the next one is in the planning, actually. It, I don't know if it will materialize. I'm not a natural writer, so it's quite a torturous process. But the <laughs> next one, if we write it, and I will co-write it with the CEO client, will be called Organization as Healer. What does it mean to run an organization in a different consciousness from the way it's run at the moment, things are run at the moment? Uh, can you talk a little bit about how you teach these CEOs uh, to embrace being a healer? Well, we work with their inner process. And the more we work with their inner process, the more they, the way they lead transforms. So it's, it's just I kind of a... I mean, I work with some people who run really big organizations and I get texts from them saying, we just had a board meeting. The whole way I led it and the interventions I made brought a completely new way of relating. I, I look forward to reading your book. I... I think you'll enjoy it, Dave. Actually, I really do. <laughs> no, I, I, I know that I will enjoy it, and um, no, I, I really, really appreciate you taking the time to to talk with me and and share your story with my audience. And it, I've touched on bits and pieces of this in in other conversations and other interviews but you know they were just it's like you brought it all together mm. uh it, it's very powerful mm. um it, yeah there i've had several uh interviews on here that discuss the energy uh there was a, a gentleman who he had spent some time as a monk uh, mm -hmm. and then used his experience to, you know, help uh, other, well, to help executives achieve, you know, higher performance. And, mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it's interesting, but it, there was that aspect that, that you're talking about um, the, the deep work. Mm. Right. Right. Uh, yeah. yeah. Now, 
is there anything that we didn't touch on that you feel is important to leave with the listeners? Um, maybe there's a whole chapter in the book on purpose, which is obviously, as we know, a big topic in organizational world now. And maybe I'd like to leave with the just there are two questions that I put in the chapter that are a little bit different from how we sometimes think about purpose. And the first question that I think we all need to ask ourselves is, what is the work that is mine to do? Because if we live into that, we're living into like a core part of who we are in this world. What is really the work that is specifically mine to do? What's my gift? What's my calling? And then the second question, which is takes it a step further, is what is it that is being asked of me now? Because that means I have to listen in a much deeper way. It's way beyond what do I want to do. What is it that is being asked of me now? That's like a bowing. And then we're in a different kind of service. It's not about me. What contribution? How am I being asked to use the work that is mine to do? How, how might I offer it? How might I make the right contribution? And it's not about size or scale. It's what's my offering. So what's being asked of me now? And it's really powerful when at the end of two or three days, a group is ready, of senior people is ready, that we sit in a circle and that question drops in and you see people listening. And then people say some pretty interesting stuff. I've had people who've gone away and changed a major part of their business once they really listen to that. Thank you so much for for having this conversation with me, and I I really hope that it it resonates with the listeners because what I feel right now, I, I feel incredible right now. Uh, mm. I one of the things that I did notice was uh, just I don't know the my the position of my body. Right. Exactly. 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 That's why I said this has to go into the body. It can't just be intellectual. I, I, it's true what you're saying. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> it's incredible. Well, I, thank you. Thank yes. you. It's been a real pleasure. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, and, and for all of those listening, the the best place for people to connect with you and, and find your book? Uh, follow me on LinkedIn. I have a great newsletter that has a lot of quite strong material and my website, nicholasiani.com. And the book obviously is available on Amazon. All right. Well, definitely to, to those of you out there listening, you've got to order his book check out his website there is uh we just scraped the the surface on his story and a lot of it is covered on his website definitely worth reading uh man i i'm blown away thank you so much for taking the time to to speak with me and share a, a little piece of your story a little piece of your wisdom and um i, I know that i'm better uh for having this having had this conversation and so am i dave so really all the very very best to you thank you for your receptivity yes, sir. thank you for listening to this episode of from embers to excellence 
please visit hollenbachleadership.com for additional content. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave a review.